um, speaker series. This is being hosted by the um, Mental Health Disparities and Community Engagement Corps for CHARM, which is a center for HIV and research and mental health here at the University of Miami. My name is Sunisha Dale, and I am a faculty member here at UM and also the director of the Corps. I am super, super, super excited for the current speaker, Dr. Daniel Driffin. And I'll tell you a bit about um, this amazing person that we're blessed to have today before he launches into his talk. So Dr. Daniel Driffin um, is an external relations project manager, and he is based in the HIV Vaccine Trials Network Leadership and Operations Center at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. His primary focus will be on implementing stakeholder engagement strategies domestically and globally. These strategies create opportunities for consultation with key stakeholders and communities to inform the design and implementation of network studies. Consultations will optimize the inclusion and participation of populations and communities who bear the greatest burden of the HIV and COVID-19 um, epidemics. Daniel has, Dr. Driffin has worked at the intersection of advocacy and assisting communities impacted by HIV for the past decade in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the creator of and senior advisor to D3 Consultant LLC. The consultant firm assists small to mid-sized community-based organizations, health departments, and other programs aligned with engaging men of color within healthcare settings, not limited to HIV prevention, research, and treatment, but also within systems providing increased health literacy and culturally connected services. He most recently served as co-founder and director of external affairs with Thrive Support Services, Inc., a patient advocacy and social support network for black gay men living with HIV. He received his Bachelor of Science in Biology from Morris College and a master's degree in public health from Morehouse School of Medicine and recently completed a doctoral degree in public health from Georgia State University. He hopes to leverage his doctor in public health, doctorate in public health training to continue using his influence to create community-driven solutions to improve HIV health outcomes for marginalized communities. And today he's going to be speaking with us on the experiences of HIV thorough conversion among black sexual minority men. Thank you so much for have, um, for being with us, Dr. Um, Driffin. I'm super excited for this talk and for the conversation that follows. For everyone that's joining us on Facebook or in the Zoom platform, know that throughout the talk, you're welcome to um, post questions in the Q&A or in the chat, or and if you're on Facebook, you could place comments there in the comment section and our fabulous coordinator, Mei Jin, will relay them to us during the discussion section. So please, again, Feel free to engage via the chat, the Q&A, et cetera, and we'll have a discussion um, once Dr. Driffin wraps up. So Dr. Driffin, the ball is in your court. Thank you so very much, Dr. Dell. It gives me great pleasure to share a virtual space with you guys um, in order to discuss something um, really, really close um, to home with me. So as Dr. Dell said, I'm Daniel Driffin. Uh, he, him pronouns, I've lived here in Atlanta, Georgia for about 15 or so years. Um, and I've worked in the HIV continuum. So research, prevention, care, mobilization over the last 16 years. Um, I'm super happy to share some of the qualitative findings connected to my doctoral dissertation that I recently completed while at Georgia State University here in Atlanta, Georgia. So this is the scariest part. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's make sure it works. You should be able to see, um, okay, excellent. So again, thank you all. Um, and as Dr. Dale was saying, feel free to drop in questions, comments in the chat section, and we will um, get to it at the conclusion of the discussion. And just know I am a recovering um, student. So there's like three nerdy slides in this slide set, but I promise you I won't like lose myself on them, okay? So let's begin. So this is um, truly just a snapshot about me. Um, from a quick couple of pictures, I like to think this is the continuum of my public health um, journey up until this point. So um, the leftmost picture is me graduating from my undergraduate degree, my grandfather, um, the next picture is truly when I started to think of myself 
um, as an activist um, at the intersection of HIV and Black same gender loving men. It was a Facebook posting specifically when I shared um, that I was living with HIV. So it says, Today, seven years ago, I found out that I tested positive in Columbia, South Carolina. I can clearly remember the initial thoughts of me not being able to do many things. I thought no one would ever want me again. Little did I know the milkshake still would bring the boys to the yard. And this really captured what we ultimately, we being Thrive Support Services, termed as our seroversary. And um, the seroversary are the days that people living with HIV find out that they're living with HIV uh, but rather than be sad and be, you know, depressed on those days, we put happiness, we put joy, we put celebration into those days. That anniversary ultimately led me um, to, with two others, um, create Thrive Support Services. I've had the opportunity to speak at the National Institute of Health, um, further speak at the Democratic National Convention um, back in 2016, where individuals really began to think about what does it mean to end HIV differently using treatment as prevention and um, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. And finally, um, a picture um, at Hooding this past December with my doctorate of public health. So this is a um, flash forward of our discussion today. I'll begin our discussion with a quick statement of the problem. Um, and that will really flow into how did this study come about with the specific two research questions that I investigated. I will we'll save you the nerdiness and just overview some of the literature review that really helped me get to um, the meat of this conversation. We'll talk about what I did within the methodology section. We'll talk about some of the data analysis and results, and we'll wrap up with some discussion, recommendations, and conclusions. So why are we here? We still see more than 36,000 new diagnoses associated with HIV across the United States of America. Specifically, when we think about Black sexually minority men, um, we are a very, very small piece of the population, yet more than 26% of new diagnoses correspond in the Black sexually minority men. So um, again, we know HIV treatment and prevention advances work. However, they only work when people are able to get the medication and take the medication as prescribed. And finally, we have the opportunity to increase innovation as we think about what does it mean to end HIV across our key communities. This is just a quick infographic, um, just again, driving home the stark disparities. So from the first column, you see Black, gay, and bisexual men account for the majority of new diagnoses in the nation. And ultimately, to the most right column, um, that speaks to viral suppression. And again, you see stark disparities. Black, sexually minority men, um, gay, bisexual, are the lowest um, when we see viral suppression. And that is that true conversation of undetectable equals untransmittable. So as a student, we always have to have some type of theoretical framework um, that really centers the conversation. Um, for me, I use the following two frameworks to center um, what I hope to look for in my dissertation. Um, the first one was the intersectionality um, um, framework. And that is a framework that has been around since 1989. And it was first introduced by Dr. Dr. Kimberly williams Crenshaw. Um, and it really highlights the importance of inequities, of oppressions, and discrimination across interlocking system. So truly, when you think about race, when you think about sexuality, when you think about gender, how those three things, or the multiple lenses that makes pieces of us come to life, how those interlocking systems either push someone um, from being you know, healthier, whole um, to be in less healthy, less whole. The second um, theoretical framework that I really use was called the syndemics um, theory. And the syndemics, again, is another way of discussing interweaving, interwoven epidemics and social conditions that ultimately creates um, a, a 
unhealthy system where folks live in. You know, so um, at the bottom of the screen, you see violence, you see substance use, you see HIV infection, and ultimately adverse um, mental health. In that center, where all of those um, circles meet that convergence, is a syndemic, okay? Oftentimes, when we think about the communities um, that we call home, you know, um, we are in that center, you know, so whether or not you're thinking about HIV, um, this is also, you know, reflective of like housing instability. This is also um, reflective of, you know, decreased health access as a result of um, transportation and even geography. So again, two theoretical frameworks that really highlights the um, how oppressions, how discrimination can keep individuals um, less healthy. So this um, study, like many of my ideas, truly are birthed from the community. Um, while sitting at a conference, I was talking to a friend um, that shared the fact that they recently seroconverted or learned that they were living with HIV. Um, this person, you know, started his uh, started their HIV um, career as a person who identified as negative, and ultimately, at some point in time, they learned that they were living with HIV. Um, this conversation was a one-off conversation, you know, in the middle of the night, but it came back to me a couple of weeks later and literally after the second or third time sharing it with one or two, um, close colleagues, um, it just jumped off of the paper. Um, so I, you know, wanted to develop this mixed method descriptive feminological, I still cannot say that word, um, study to look at the lived experiences of Black sexually minority men employed in the HIV workforce who learned that they were living with HIV. Um, and the second piece was how organizational culture among our workforce may impact HIV treatment um, and prevention services for the same population. So again, um, these were the two research questions. Um, within our discussion today, I'm gonna just focus in on um, question number one, and that um, is what are the what are black sexually minority men experiences within the HIV workforce who experienced a seroconversion? So again, what happened? What you know? What was their experiences? But of those men who were negative when they first started working in the HIV field and ultimately learned that they were positive at some point in time. So let's dive into the nerdiness um, of the study. Uh, so this is just a flow chart of basically how I built um, the keywords in an in inclusion criteria are what I was going to talk about, okay? So ultimately looked at five databases. I used these keywords underneath um, uh, in that middle part of the slide. Um, it turned out to give me 1,600 articles after weaving out uh, editorials, dissertations, conference abstracts, things that was published before 98, no mention of black sexually minority men um, and no nothing that was um, anything that was not in English or conducted in the United States. It left me with um, 64 studies to put in. So think about that for a minute, okay? We've been researching HIV for countless years. To begin at 1,600 articles and ultimately only have 64 to include in um, this you know, conversation truly drives home the importance of the topic, okay? Um, so I started with the workforce. And basically, the HIV workforce is a mixed level of practitioners, professionals, um, de delivering medical and social support for people living with an impact by HIV. And again, you know this, okay? <laughs> so I'm not gonna uh, stay on these next couple of slides. Um, the workforce is truly diverse um, and that truly depends on what part of the country we are um, in. It also truly depends on who is paying for the services that's being um, delivered. But ultimately we believe, I believe greater diversification is needed Needed, um, to make new solutions. Again, what are HIV seroconversions? So a seroconversion is that period of time um, for which it takes an HIV antibody test to become detectable, okay? Um, so again, 
you know, it, it takes our body anywhere from a few weeks um, to a couple of months to ultimately develop enough antibodies or antigens for a test to say preliminary positive or reactive. All right. Um, across this globe, we have limited research um, specifically um, on Black sexually minority men who have experienced seroconversions, okay? Um, and finally, um, looking at that intersection of Black sexually minority men working in HIV that experience an um, HIV seroconversion, I ultimately only found two um, gray literature. So that's like magazine articles, blogs um, that were citable. Um, one with a physician back in 2007, and most recently um, one in 2019 um, of a HIV prevention manager who started on PrEP, um, but ultimately lost insurance and ultimately Sarah converted. So again, um, this has been occurring for more than, you know, 40 years. But the fact that there's only so limited number, it really drove home the point of why I wanted to study this more. I had a great deal of conversation around um, HIV treatment and prevention continuum. Um, and again, ultimately, you know this also. Taking HIV antiretroviral therapy um, leads to being undetectable, all right? Um, the more people um, living with HIV who are undetectable, the healthier they are, all right? Um, we've seen the earliest glimpse of treatment as prevention working from the 90s, you know, and that was truly with um, child um, mothers who were expecting children, as long as they were given AZT and had a bloodless birth, their child was not born with HIV. Um, so ultimately, Black sexually minority men witness and bear the brunt of disparities when we think about HIV viral suppression and even PrEP utilization. Um, a CDC study came out a few weeks back that showed white men um, who had PrEP indications um, were roughly 90% prescribed PrEP. Flip the, flip the script, okay? That same study showed that Black men with the same PrEP indications were only 13% prescribed PrEP. So we have to do something different. Um, you cannot talk about HIV anything without talking about HIV intersectional stigma. Um, again, intersectional stigma is that exponential impact of stigma as a result of our lived experiences, all right? So in this picture, you see race, you see uh, HIV stigma, you see sexual orientation. Um, again, where those three circles converge, that's where um, the most um, stigma, the most anticipated. So you thinking that it will happen, the most enacted. So you feeling stigma as a result of the policies that are governing your life. Um, so like HIV criminalization or even just going to a provider office that only take care of their patients on Fridays, okay? Um, finally, to internalize. So as a result of you living with HIV, you value yourself lower. So again, intersectional stigma is a crucial conversation. We have to, you know, have more conversations like we're having today, but we also have to have more intersectional research um, to dive deep um, into this topic. And finally, a nerd slide. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take it easy. This is a nerd slide. Uh, but implementation science is basically looking at how we implement or how we deliver services for key communities and what can we do differently to increase um, outcomes, okay? So that looks like rather than, you know, not necessarily doing a five-year study with a thousand men? Can we do a two-year study with a hundred men, you know, to get to the same type of results? Again, um, I believe implementation um, is one of the ways that we can find new ways of fixing broken systems. Um, and that last bullet just talks about some of the um, cool implementation science that's going on across the HIV prevention trials network with key studies like 061, 073, and 096, um, specifically um, for Black gay men led by Black gay men. So methods, basically, how did I do what I did? 
Um, again, this was a mixed method study. By mixed method, I wanted to ask a how, but I also wanted to ask a how many. So that's the qualitative and quantitative approach. Um, descriptive phenomenology. Phen okay, descriptive phenomenology. Basically, showing describing this phenomena okay that's that's the take home all right um again the phenomena that i was looking at were the hiv seroperversions amongst a group of men and that group was black sexually minority men all right um this methodology was the most appropriate to unearth um these experiences and not necessarily focus in on the why it happened but just learning about how okay So um, again, the qualitative approach, it was a purposeful sample, meaning um, I had a list of individuals who had shared that they seroconverted at some point in time in their HIV field. Um, so I asked them, you know, would they be interested in sitting down with me and talking about it? They said yes. Um, I ran into like a little block. A friend made a Facebook post for me. And literally, I had 10 more people to talk to within the week. OK, so community is always there to support. A. Eh? Um, the interviews were semi-structured. So I had a couple of questions that I um, flowed through. But ultimately, based on the questions, Based on the answers of the participants, um, it took me different directions. Again, I talked to Black sexually minority men um, with an HIV sero conversion experience. Um, as a result of them sitting down with me, I um, provided them a $100 gift card. And ultimately, I sat through and hand-coded these interviews. Um, these were two quick recruitment flyers that I used. Um, again, QR codes, um, a bit.ly just to track how many people click the link, um, just, you know, and that helps like with data analysis. We don't have to talk about that. I'll skip that. Uh, so let's talk about some of the findings, okay? <laughs> So again, um, I am focusing in on the qualitative re results of um, the study. So um, I had the opportunity to sit down and interview 10 Black sexually minority men um, who experienced a seroconversion at some point in time in their career. Um, I collected the data between June and July of 2023, um, and this table is some um, selected characteristics of individuals. So roughly 80% um, were, um, were between the age of 30 and 39, and the final two were above 40. Again, um, the sample was um, had some, pretty much some level of education. You know, we see easily... The majority of the folks worked in HIV for more than six years. The majority were in the South and, um, you know, close to all lived with HIV for more than um, six years. Uh, with two of the participants actually living with HIV from the earliest days of the epidemic. And I thought that was really interesting. So 10 interviews, 527 minutes of recorded time, ultimately turned into 150 pages of interview notes. Um, after sitting down and listening to what the what my participants said, um, I, I identified 134 individual codes, but that ultimately turned into what are known as themes and sub-themes. Um, the following seven themes were identified and nine sub-themes were identified. And over the next couple of slides, um, we'll dive deeper into the um, into the bubbles that's on the right hand side of the slide. So the first um, conversation that really popped up through all of the discussions was navigating the world, um, and individuals continue to request more, um, especially around navigating the world. These quotes highlight some sub themes of coming of age, dating, um, navigating sex, and ultimately using mobile applications. And um, each color corresponds to a different um, conversation. So you see, quote, as a black gay man served um, as my mentor and opened my eyes to HIV and other things. So again, the importance of mentorship um, immediately stood up. Mentors also helped folks get established in the prevention and treatment field. Um, next up, thinking about how to date and sex. Um, 
one of the individuals said, I just felt like they never talked about sex and even more particularly, like what it means to be a gay man having sex. And then finally that overlay of being black, being gay and being a man. Um, and I'll read this last um, green one. When you are on the apps, you see that undetectable or pause and you might skip it because you don't understand what that really means. And they just being upfront with you. So again, it, it's beginning to outlay those deeper inner conversations that we may not, um, we didn't know was occurring across the community, especially across the community as people working in the field that experienced this. That's really what I want you know to highlight. So next up, uh, we discuss family, shame, and mental health. Um, so again. Family matters, not um, not only biological, but chosen family um, is important. Shame um, truly ran deep, um, specifically connected to Sarah conversions. And lastly, mental health is crucial as we think about reducing anxiety and stress related to intersectional stigma. So um, one about family, I called my best friend. He's also positive and he was in disbelief, but said it's nothing. And the best friend helped them navigate services. Looking at that shame, if I'm being honest, um, shame is a daily st struggle. I don't think that I still um, have ever circled back to redefine my value. So again, if seroconversions and less value is connected, of course, we have to have a deeper conversation. And uh, finally, just the importance of mental health um, therapy um, came up in one of the light blue circles. I had to take something off the plate once my HIV was controlled. My focus and energy changed thanks to my therapist, eating healthier and working out um, and being around the right people. So again, going to that chosen aspect of what family means. Um, intersectional stigma. Um, this came up throughout the conversation and I had to read uh, the other light blue bullet. Um, so I quote, I didn't want to be a statistic. I'm already overweight and fat. I didn't need anything else to deal with. So again, instantly we see how body image, sexual desirability, um, living with HIV all plays into this conversation. So it wouldn't be an HIV study if we didn't talk about our um, healthcare providers. Uh, and again, you know, we've been talking about these same conversations for a while now, but we need, um, but providers have to think about providing additional comfortability, um, cultural competency, and the importance of provider's identity. So uh, we'll start with, quote, I wasn't comfortable in asking my family physician about PrEP or sexual health matters. So if you are not comfortable talking to your provider about PrEP, about sex, think about the, you know, vulnerabilities you are opening yourself up to, okay? Um, the second bullet, it, again, it meets that intersection of not only providers, but also care and also geography. So it says, I came to Atlanta um, and staying on PrEP became harder for me with a new provider. And that's truly why I stopped taking PrEP because I had to try to build a new relationship with a provider that I can trust. So again, the importance of trust. Okay. And um, let's grab one of these blue ones. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of as my career is gathering an all, um, gathering a staff of Black gay men. Um, but ultimately, this participant said, who sadly near all of them have died at this point. So again, just thinking of the historical nature of HIV and the harm um, that is done on Black sexually minority men. So this um, truly like blew me out of the water um, and I call it the HIV viral cast system. So um, HIV stigmatization, so let me start over. This is, <laughs> I'm calling it a caste system. And just for background, a caste system is a system of social stratification where those members living at the top of the caste system may benefit from privileges and being seen as more valuable than those at the bottom, okay? Um, so ultimately, I learned that desirability, sexual desirability and social acceptance is being connected to HIV viral loads. 
Okay. So those individuals who report not living with HIV or um, and on PrEP, those individuals were deemed most desirable and at the top of the cast. Okay. Um, dictator in this pyramid. Um, the next lower level was not living with HIV or unsure and not on PrEP, um, followed by living with HIV and undetectable viral load. And the bottom of this cast was living with HIV with a detectable viral load. So again, this was amongst individual, hey, 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 stop taking this picture. It's gonna, it's coming out soon. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this was amongst Black sexually minority men inside of the HIV workforce. So if this is going on inside of the workforce, we can only imagine what is happening across the community when we think about social desirability and um, viral load um, rates. So these are some of the quotes that corresponded to the different levels. Um, I, I'll start with the bottom of the cast in the blue. If I said I was detectable, I think my um, assumption would be that of a rejection. So again, if one shared that they have a detectable viral load, um, this individual believed they would not be dateable. Okay, moving up to the next, um, the next um, cast. I was glad once I became undetectable, since, you know, they say um, people, sometimes people don't get to be an undetectable. So again, we're already creating like inter stratification across community, you know, so individuals who can um, achieve an undetectable viral load and who cannot, okay? Um this other gold one, public health has not always acknowledged the complexities um, or the complex realities of living with HIV and being undetectable. We um, have to detangle if a person who is living with HIV is better um, while taking medication um, and ultimately undetectable. So again, deep, deep, deep conversations that we are just beginning um, to touch, okay? Um, and the final theme was a theme around pleasure. Um, and, you know, individuals identified um, opportunities of developing and evaluating pleasure-based strategies to reduce seroconversions. So again, if we change the way we communicate about sex, if we change the way we communicate about HIV prevention and treatment, we could see a reduction um, in seroconversions. Um, I thought this last um, bullet closest to the right was... Um, really important. It says, we are still selling the gold standard um, with condoms, but it's the least pleasurable and a focus of pleasure might start a different conversation. And I think just this morning, um, a research article specifically connected to the American Men's Internet Survey, AMOS, um, shared that men using PrEP um, were less um, likely to use condoms during condomless um, anal um, intercourse. So again, we had to have a new conversation on condom use and biomedical options. So discussion, recommendation, and conclusion. So we're getting to the end. So get ready to drop some things in the chat. Get ready to ch chat with us, okay? Um, so just to highlight again, um, I asked 10 Black sexually minority men their experiences of seroconverting. Um, again, this was the first time um, this has been done um, across the literature. Um, I thought I was going to have difficulties finding 10 folks, but actually I got to the end of 10 um, interviews and close to seven more folks, um, you know, started conversations with me and wanted to share their experiences. Ultimately, the IRB said no, uh, but I will be talking to those seven uh, really, really soon in part two of this conversation. Um, again, seven themes uh, were identified, nine sub-themes were identified, and it just lends itself an opportunity to a deeper um, discussion. So two community implications, one viral load suppression. Um, I think most of you all on this uh, webinar um, know that the United States Department of Health and Human Services defined viral load suppression as 200 copies of HIV under uh, per milliliter of blood. Okay, that's the 
government definition. Yet, dependent on the agency, depending on where you seek care, you may have a different clinical value. Um, so this is a quick little depiction that I made after like five hours of cutting and gluing on PowerPoint, but it came out really pretty. So um, again, the government definition is this first test tube um, on the other side of the perforated line, okay? 200 copies um, per milliliter. Clinical research trials generally count 50 copies as being undetectable, okay? Certain public health funded clinics count 40 copies, okay? And they say that's undetectable. My clinic, the doctor office that takes care of me as a person living with HIV for the last 16 years, they count 20 copies, okay? So we have 20 copies, we have 40 copies, we have 50 copies, we have 200 copies. There's no uniform measurement. And I think if we have a uniform measurement, we will have a simpler conversation. Okay, implication number one. Implication number two, pleasure-based communication can work. If we stop saying unprotected sex, if we stop saying HIV infected, if we start saying target populations, we can have a people-first, trauma-informed, um, back-and-forth communication that ultimately can keep people in care longer. Okay, uh, so that's community implication number two. The language we use matter and we have to change it. So limitations. Again, um, the findings are not generalizable since I only talked to a handful of guys. Um, this is all self-reported data. Of course, I am like the easiest person to talk to. So I know folks are telling me the truth. But when I write it up, um, I had to say, you know, it's self-reported data. So they may not recall everything because some of the um, seroconversions happened more than 40 years ago, you know, um, and they could have been telling me what I wanted to hear. And um, lastly, thematic saturation. So finding the themes that identified may have occurred quicker um, than normal due to the small sample size. Um, long story short to say, hey, we did it. It gives me opportunity to do more of it. And that's really what I'm excited uh, to talk more about. So conclusion, um, again, um, our community continue to face exponential levels of intersectional stigma. Um, I, I think my um, my dissertation, you know, findings show that instantly. Um, again, put in mental health, put in body image, put in living with HIV, put in geography. At that same conversation, um, intersectional stigma would definitely pop up. Experiencing an HIV seroconversion um, further entrenches stigma and shame. So picture it. You're um, a health educator in, you know, a small town or even a big town. I'm talking to you guys in Miami. Imagine someone learning that they're living with HIV. Um, that's delivering services at a local health department. How difficult do you think it is to access, you know, those services at that same health department or even at a sister organization? You know, so that's when we think about stigma and shame. And finally, um, HIV service delivery can foster brave spaces towards empowerment. And ultimately, we have what it takes to create a new um, solution. So these are some of the references. I hope I didn't talk too fast. And these are just some pictures over... Um, over the life of the project. So beginning with February 27th, like yesterday, yesterday, two years ago, I made a post saying I'm beginning the initial ideas for my dissertation. Um, and if you're a black male worked in HIV, hit me up. Okay, ultimately to the um, transcripts that's lower, um, all the themes, um, again, my mother, wishing me uh, greatness on my dissertation defense that morning. Um, even me asking the universe, I needed $5,000 to complete my dissertation to provide incentives for the guys that um, I sat with. Within 20 minutes, two organizations um, gave me a check to provide incentives for the guys that uh, participated in my um, dissertation. And ultimately, um, the last picture is the completed work um, turning once I turned it in this past October. Oh, OK. So that's that. I did it. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. 
That's beautiful. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, um, thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Dreffin, but it's not just about my reaction. Let's jump into the Q&A. I have some questions for you myself, but I'm gonna let the audience um, engage here. So one of the first questions was, so regarding um, the cast um, system that you shared um, that I was so blown away by, so I'm like, <laughs> anyway, um, um, one person asked here, it being at the top of that um, layered system, um, is that at odds with the lower rates of PrEP among um, um, Black men who have sex with men, same gender loving men, right? <laughs> I think it has to. I think it has to. You know, I, I think if if we know that only 13% of Black men with PrEP indications have a prescription, mm -hmm. then like how many people truly are at, in, in that small cast? You mm -hmm. know, small mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I mean, we also have to factor in that as a result of racism across mm -hmm. the LGBTQ um, mm -hmm. community, you know, black men are more likely to have sex and, and interact with other black men. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so if mm -hmm. you are already in a smaller population yeah. with that much more, um, you know, um, burden of disease as a result of mm -hmm. health access, yeah. uh, like, it's, 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 yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also here, let me see. Oh, um, another uh, um, part of that was whether or not you think that caste system was a function of your sample being in the HIV workforce, like how they were constructing and thinking of where people um, fall. I I sit and toil with that, right? Um, because I am a person of the world. Um, meaning, you know, mm -hmm. I am also on the dating apps at times. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, while perusing um, different profiles, um, everyone is on prep and everyone is undetectable. Oh, in terms of social desirability, keep it going. We know amongst mm -hmm. Black men living with HIV, mm -hmm. viral suppression is about 63%. So roughly less mm -hmm. than two out of three, two mm -hmm. out of three in a circle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, are virally suppressed. Everyone can't be undetectable, mm -hmm. you know, um, even if you go in and out of viral suppression, you know, where is the space that those individuals can say that? That exactly. You know? exactly. So I do think it's wider. It, it's a it's wider across the community um, mm -hmm. than, than what we think. So essentially, the the um, participants have a lot of insight about this and what they're seeing dynamically in their world, but also being um, a part of the community as well as you're sharing that they're seeing these things online. And before when I jumped in and said the social desirability piece, it's a, you know, a big bias as we know that people talk about when it comes to people advertising or sharing things or filling out survey. You look on Facebook and Twitter, everyone has an excellent, wonderful life. I right? live my best life and stuff's falling apart in the background. But you know, so the fact that like social expectations and narratives and also all the stigma and intersectionality pieces you talk about, then kind of pull people towards putting something up that they think may align to that, even when it's not aligned to their experience or reality. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Um, I'm looking here, great talk, great talk. Bring bring the questions guys, are there any more? I, didn't, I looked in the Q&A and out the chat, but I'll keep skimming here. So um, one of the, the questions um, that was coming up for me, you know, as you were talking there was, if you were to get to be given an unlimited amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. Which to use to enact change to address what you observe um, and learned through this work, what would that look like? So where where do we need to go? So I think it I think it has to be a dual approach. So one, it has to start with the interactions between our medical providers. Okay. Being that prep um and treatment for HIV um truly starts most times at a prescription uh, pad. Okay. Um, and I think, I think, um, some of the work that 
we're doing with HB, the HIV Prevention Trials mm -hmm. Network 096, um, there's a um, cross-cultural, um, it's called CRISP, what does it stand for? Cultural, it's an intersectional stigma project yes. delivered at the healthcare facility. Okay. I think for so many conversations, we start our answers at the individual level and yes. not necessarily the system level. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so I would, you know, flip the conversation and start at the system level, you know. Um, and again, like we're not going to intervene with every medical provider, but if we intervene with enough of the systems that take care of 75, 80% of these guys living with HIV or vulnerable to HIV, I think we'll have mm -hmm. a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and second, um, thinking about the individual, it would be truly a conversation of not taking no for an answer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I have been on injectable treatment for two years now, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I had a doctor's appointment just before this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting dressed, putting clothes on to go to the appointment. Mm -hmm. okay? The Walgreens pharmacist called me and said, they're because of have hack that's going across the system, um, the people who pay for your copay, so I have a $50 copay mm -hmm. on my medication. The people who pay this $50 cannot pay it right now. And I cannot release your cab and Nuva, um, for you to take it if you mm -hmm. don't pay the $50. Mm -hmm. I'm in a place that I can pay the $50. Mm -hmm. What about the individuals who cannot pay the $50? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, like, mm -hmm. like what mm -hmm. are they supposed to do? You know, mm -hmm. as and as we continue to, you know, see more longer acting um meds, you know, the window of forgiveness may decrease, you know. So mm -hmm. if I cannot get fifty dollars in the next twenty minutes, thirty minutes, mm -hmm. seven days, ten mm -hmm. days, you know, mm -hmm. now I am toiling on the conversation of mm -hmm. not being adherent and yes. getting to become biremic. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. the pharmacist offered no support. No mm -hmm. support, no, well, you know, maybe you can call so and so. Yeah. You got nothing. It was a, well, if you don't have it, girl, you ain't going to get this medicine today. You know, so yeah. not not taking a no um, as a patient, like um, it, I think would go a long way. Teaching folks how to advocate, how to be, you know, um, a peer um, peer navigation for themselves, um, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. My other question, you guys ain't coming in with the questions over there, okay? I, so I, I see I, one in the Q. You see one that I'm missing. What does it say? So, um, someone mentioned. Um, Concerning viral load um, and being under a thousand copies. So, so basically, um, there's some new research. Not even new research. There's research out there that shows um, transmission. So, passing mm -hmm. HIV on um, mm -hmm. is less likely under a thousand copies. Okay. Mm -hmm. I say that to say this to the person who asked the question. Mm -hmm. Who knows that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If, like the people. You are a person navigating a riot mm -hmm. care health system. If mm -hmm. you are a person navigating, you know, going to the local community health clinic, mm -hmm. um, who provider may not treat you as mm -hmm. respected. Okay. Who's mm -hmm. misgendering you? Who mm -hmm. has to navigate mm -hmm. a thirty-five minute, forty-five minute mm -hmm. bus ride? Like, how are we expecting individuals to know this scientific level of uh, information, you know, to yes. know how do they be the healthiest they are, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a larger conversation of mm -hmm. what are we talking about when we talk about viral suppression? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powerful. And even if the providers are one aware, but also how are they communicating that when they say, well, your lab said... Detectable, undetectable, X, Y, and Z, their cutoff is 20, 40, 50, right? Um, is that being conveyed? Absolutely. The other question that I really want to sneak in here is, I remember the first time I met you. 
um, but and immediately becoming like a a fan and um, because of your brilliance, but simultaneously your authenticity. And so I'm curious about in doing this work, um, how are you doing work that to some extent you are off the community, you have this voice and this experience and you are on the end of being the researcher, the questioner, the formulating, the pulling the pieces together, right? Um, what was that like for you? What is it like for you? And yeah. Of course you would ask something to mess up my mascara in the <laughs> last three minutes. Um, I, I, I think of, I think of something, um, Congressman um, John Lewis said, you know, thinking about being angelic troublemakers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I literally, my background is blurred out. I literally just like hung my degree up today, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think about the fact that as a person with advanced degrees um, who has started an organization, who serves as the first vice chair of our Atlanta Planning Council, you know, that provides care to 16,000 people living with HIV. Um, mm -hmm. If I experience issues, mm -hmm. I can only imagine what the other 16,000 folks may be experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and with the wherewithal that I have, um, I, you know, I, I, it motivates me to create a system that is more responsive to people living with HIV, like just in care resources here in our eligible metropolitan area, we receive more than $30 million to provide care for people mm -hmm. with HIV. And we roughly see viral suppression about 80 ish percent. Mm -hmm we can do so much more. Yes. There's, you know, there PEPFAR, the Presidential Emergency mm -hmm. for AIDS Relief, um, the life-saving um, program for people living with HIV across Africa, African countries, entire countries mm -hmm. have less resources than, you know, our 20 counties in Atlanta and mm -hmm. they see higher viral suppression, they see higher engagement, they see mm -hmm. higher tension you know mm -hmm. so if we have that much resources um we can do better and it's mm -hmm. truly thinking how do we mix and mold the building blocks that we know work um mm -hmm. how do we do it better to see more people out here mm -hmm. and you are a part of that yes oh my god we're at the hour thank you so much dr driffin this has been um, truly a wonderful, wonderful um, talking to be able to engage with you and have these conversations. And I see the same in the chat. But thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to everyone on Facebook and everyone um, in the chat here as well. Um, don't worry, keep engaging on Facebook, leave questions later. Um, and perhaps we can get them over to Dr. Jeffin um, to, to respond to their comments and things that he has instigated for you. But thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing and congratulations on all your major milestones. We appreciate thank you very, so much. Thank you so very much. So much. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Hey, Jean, or stop the live.